there are two readings. The first is from Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 7, verses 13 to 15. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. It is not enough to try, is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. Second reading is Matthew 1, 18 to 25. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to excuse her, expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Jesus woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Dave. I don't know if you've ever been in a shop and uh, it's busy and there's shop assistants around the place and uh, they say to you, I'll, I'll be with you in a moment. I'll be with you in a moment. One of Richard's phrases that um, I know that some of us take note of is sometimes he says, are you with me? Are you with me? When he's, when he's speaking to us, he says, are you with me? I guess some of you, especially if you've got um, children or teenagers that maybe have prepared a meal and um, they're upstairs busy doing something, maybe in their room, and you call up that dinner's ready, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'll be with you in a minute, I'll be with you. The shop assistant, us children, they're all there already. When Rich says to us, are you with me, he can see that physically we're with him in the building but he means something different, doesn't he? The shop assistant is already there in the shop with us. I'll be with you in a moment means something different. They're already physically there in a sense, but they're going to come closer. But it means a bit more than just, are you in the same space? 700 years before Jesus was born in the city of Jerusalem, there was a, a royal family and the city and the place was under siege. Things were looking difficult. In fact, things were looking hopeless. There was a lot of trouble around the place. And Isaiah, the prophet who Dave's just read that first reading from, he had a message from God to give to the king, to give to King Ahaz. And the word that God gives to Isaiah is God will come. He will be with us. Look, the young virgin girl will conceive and she will give birth to a son and he will be named Emmanuel, God with us. But you think, well, wasn't God already in some sense with us? Wasn't God already in the world? The world that he had made, the world that he had created, wasn't he already there even before Jesus was born? Wasn't God somehow in the world the shop assistant was already in the shops. We were already in the building here with Rich. The children are already upstairs. 
But in John's Gospel, it says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The God of the Bible, the creator of the world, the God who had interacted with his world all along and all his people, he was already here. God was with Adam and Eve in the garden. God spoke to Noah. God was there on the mountain with Moses in the burning bush. God went before the people as a cloud of, um, a pillar of cloud by night and a pillar of fire by day, the other way around, pillar of cloud during the day and fire at night. God was already part of his world. He's omnipresent. He is everywhere. He fills the created world, the world that he has made with his presence. But now here was this promise that God was going to come and be with us, Emmanuel, God with us. The prophecy that Isaiah gave was the promise of God to come as Jesus Christ in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, 700 years after Isaiah. The promise, the prophecy that Isaiah had given that there would be Emmanuel, God with us, that God would take on a whole new dimension, a whole new meaning. And what would that be in the person of the baby Jesus? God is now with us, asleep on the hay. God would be with us like he had never been with us before. God, the eternal world, word, in the beginning was the word, the creator, the power, the majesty, Yahweh, this God of awesomeness, would be with us He would clothe himself in flesh and bones, in skin and blood, clothe himself in our human, our limited physical nature. He would lie in a manger, completely human and yet completely divine. We'll be singing these words in a few weeks' time. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. Pleased as man with man to dwell. Jesus our Emmanuel. So why? Why would God choose to come? Why would God of the world, God of his created order, God of the universe, why would he choose to come as Emmanuel, God with us, tangible, physical presence here on earth? Why would he do that? Why did he give God, um, why did God give that prophecy to Isaiah who shared it then with King Ahaz? Why did God put Mary and Joseph through the trauma of conceiving a child before marriage? And that was a struggle. We read those words and we forget what a trauma, what potential persecution that couple would have faced. Why did the word become flesh and dwell amongst us as Emmanuel? Those of us who were awake when Dave read that reading might have noticed that in the Matthew reading, This baby, this child, this person was given two names, not just one, Emmanuel and Jesus. You are to give him the name Jesus, the angel said to Joseph. And Matthew quotes that verse from Isaiah, they will call him Emmanuel. God had a plan of salvation, a plan of rescue, a plan of reconciliation. Mark was talking about that last week. A plan for us to be rescued, for us, his beloved people, his created world, to be rescued, to be reconciled to him. And that plan necessitated that his perfect life and death on a cross would be part of it. To break down the wall of separation that our sin builds between us and God. To reconcile us to himself. In 2 Corinthians, it said, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. This was God's plan. He wanted us reconciled with him. And his plan was to come to this earth in flesh and bones as a baby, as the baby Jesus, Emmanuel, so that our sins can be forgiven and so that we can have that healthy, 
friendship, relationship back again with God, our creator. In the one name, Emmanuel, everything humanity needs, everything his world needs, the entire plan of God's salvation is included, is absorbed. The word Emmanuel, God with us, encapsulates the whole plan of God, our mighty Lord. And so in Advent, today, the start of Advent, I'm sure many of the children have got their calendars ready or their candles ready to start tomorrow. But today starts Advent, the fourth Sunday before Christmas. It starts today and we prepare ourselves, don't we? We prepare ourselves to celebrate Christmas. Mary Berry, they were quoting her on the radio this week saying that the answer to a good Christmas is that you start planning now. From the 1st of December, you start planning your Christmas. We heard from Claire in the prayers about Black Friday. People going mad on Friday, buying all sorts of things. Their preparations for Christmas. But we are different in our Advent. In Advent, the, 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 the time now that we have in the lead up to Christmas... We're preparing ourselves to celebrate, to celebrate the festival where we remember that Jesus came to earth. The second person of the Trinity, not just a normal baby, not that any babies are normal, they're all special and unique, aren't they? But you know what I mean. The second person of the Trinity, the only begotten son of the Father, the eternal word who'd been there since the creation of the world, our creator, will clothe himself in our nature, in flesh, to become man, man one with us. God himself lying in a manger, completely human and yet completely divine. In Advent, we also remember that he will come again. We had that reading from Revelation a few weeks ago about Jesus the warrior coming again. Jesus will come again. He promises us. We don't know when, Just as in the day of the message of Isaiah to Ahaz, he didn't know when that baby was going to be born. We don't know when Jesus is going to come again, but we know he will. That's part of the waiting and the expectation of Advent. We remember his birth, Emmanuel, God with us at Christmas. We anticipate his coming again. But what difference does that make to us here and now? God is the same yesterday, today and forever. So is it just a waiting game? Are we just waiting for the 25th of December? Are we just waiting for when Jesus comes again? Emmanuel, God with us, meant that a door in heaven opened and provided a new and living way for us today, for us to enter into that throne of grace with God. Emmanuel, God with us, means that with us, he is with us yesterday, today and forever. He wasn't just with Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the wise men and the innkeeper when he was born. He won't just be with us in the future at some date, but he is with us today, here and now, with us, each and every one of us. And if God is with us, who can stand against us? Something meant that the uncouth, the dirty, the smelly, the despised shepherds would return to their fields rejoicing. They came into that manger and they left rejoicing. They left different to how they had arrived. Something meant that the possibly rich, intelligent, distinguished magi, the wise men, would fall down in wonder on their knees at this tiny, vulnerable baby in the stable. Why? Why did the shepherds return different? Why did the wise men fall on their knee? They were used to having people bow at their feet. And here they were bowing at a tiny newborn baby in a stable. Why? Because they realized that they were in the presence of someone amazing, someone awesome, someone different from anything they had known before. God made man, Emmanuel, And they took his presence, they took that encounter back with them, back to the fields, back to wherever the Magi travelled on to next. They were enchanged by their encounter. 
Meeting that baby, Emmanuel, God with us in the manger, changed them and they took them with them, took him with them. I was in two minds this morning. I woke up and I had this crazy idea, but I won't make you do it. But I want you to imagine a line that stretches from Mikey across there to Claire over here. Imagine a line across the front of church. And the middle of the line, about roughly where Lawrence is, about the middle of the line, is the same. Okay? Mikey is worse and Claire is better. He's not, but I'm just using him, all right? Don't, don't, don't worry about that, Mikey, okay? Imagine that's a line, a spectrum. We've all, I think, all of us here have encountered God in some way in our lives. Otherwise, I guess we wouldn't be sitting here this morning. We, we've met with the presence of God in some way, whether it's through worship, as Claire said, whether it's through all sorts of different ways. What I would like you to do is just imagine, before you even knew about God, before you'd ever encountered him in any way, if you can remember back before then, and now you've met with Jesus, God, Emmanuel, is your life better as a result of knowing him in some way? And I don't mean easier, because I know that for some of us, life isn't easier than it was last year, or wasn't, isn't easier than it was 20 years ago. But is our life better because we have met with Jesus in some way. Have a little think for that for a moment. Is it better or is it worse, having met with Jesus? Great, I'm glad it's better, Lisa, that's brilliant. Okay, now think of that line. Where on the line would you stand? Would you stand in the middle, where it's the same? It's no different, your life's no different now from where it was before you knew Jesus. Is it in some ways worse? And how far away from the middle would you stand? Or is it in some ways better? How far nearer Claire would you stand? How much better is it? How different are our lives, better or worse, or the same, for having had a meeting, an encounter with God who is with us? I'd love to do that one day and get us all just to come and stand because it will be different for all of us and it will be different today to how it might be next week. Today you might be thinking it's the best thing ever that you know Jesus and tomorrow you might have a struggle and you might think, hopefully not that it's the worst day ever since you met Jesus, but is it better knowing Jesus or is your life worse because of Jesus or is it in the middle? I reckon those shepherds and those wise men would be beyond even Claire. Even Mary and Joseph, who'd had a difficult time, they now had this awesome baby that they had responsibility for. They couldn't, you know, this was Jesus, this was God, this was Emmanuel with them. But even so, I reckon they would be out the church and somewhere in Rich's garden over there because having had an encounter with Jesus, their life was better than it had ever been before. And yet often we say, don't we, we hear we hear people, we hear ourselves say, I can't do that. I can't do that. We hear words about the church. The church is dying on its feet. The church is ineffective. The church is... And yet, God is with us. If God is with us, if God is inside us, how can the church be dying on its feet? Now, there's a whole question there. We're not going to go into that right now. But if God is with us, if God is living in each one of us, how can we say, I can't do that? Because God, the God who created the heavens and the earth, the God who came to earth as that tiny little baby, the God who allowed Mary, a virgin, to conceive and, be, and give birth to this baby, if God can do that, what can God do in our lives if we just but let him Dave was telling me a story, just a short story in the piece about um, a lovely lady um, who lived up in Fox Hill who died a couple of weeks ago and it was her cremation on Friday. And there was lots of stories about her life apparently, but they were travelling across America and it was off across the flat and the plains and then there were the Rocky Mountains, these huge mountains. And there was delight on her face. There, look at those mountains. And it really symbolised to Dave the, the life of this lady. There was never an obstacle that was too big for her. Life wasn't easy for her. Life was difficult. But there, there was never an obstacle she, she felt she couldn't negotiate with Jesus. God didn't put the obstacles in, there, in her way, the challenges of life. But with God, 
with God in her and living with her and in her. She, she went through life and she did amazing things. She was one of the coordinators of the shoe boxes. You know, at Christmas, we often pack up shoe boxes that go out to the children in Romania and things. She was one of the ladies who in Bath helped coordinate that. There was nothing too difficult for her because she knew that God was with her. God was within her. So God with us, that we remember at Christmas as this little baby, God that we know is going to come again, that God is with us here and now, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so this Advent, I'd love us to prepare, to prepare for Christmas, not in all the secular ways that are all around us that we, we cannot avoid, whether in the Christmas market and all the crowds of people, whether it's seeing Black Friday on the news, whatever it is, whether it's Mary Berry getting your menu sorted and organised, whatever it is. Yeah, those things are part of what we do, aren't they? But actually more importantly than that, this Christmas, as we prepare to celebrate the the birth of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, from 2,000 years ago, as we remember that Jesus will come again and we have that hope, the candle of hope was lit today. Let us also commit to live with Emmanuel, God with us, today, each and every one of us. May our daily lives, may our lives each day, this Advent, reflect the God who lives in us and with us, so that our lives can be different from the world. When everyone else is running around frazzled, I pray that our lives will reflect something different so that the, the positive impact of having God with us, the positive impact of Jesus will make a difference that can bless other people so that we can be agents of change. We, we won't say, I can't do that, but we'll say, I can do that because God is with us so that we might see his kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven, putting the impossibility out of existence. People say it's impossible that Jesus could be born. God could be born through a human teenage girl. It wasn't impossible. It happened. God can dispense with, get rid of the impossibility. We can't do it on our own, but with Emmanuel, with Jesus, with God with us, our Saviour and our Lord, Anything is possible and we can see heaven come on earth as it is in heaven, so it will be on earth. 